I'm Herb Williams, age 92 and counting. I like all forms of music. I like classical. I played with a, a polka band once. I enjoyed that. I, I've done everything. So I, I enjoy them all, but my specialty, of course, is uh, the Great American Songbook. I liked uh, Sarah Vaughan, of course, and Ella Fitzgerald. Coleman Hawkins and Ben Webster and, and that, the people that era were, were the ones that I um, uh, liked most, but I never copied them. I just uh, listened to them, and they were influenced, they influenced me by the, the many uh, uh, colorations of jazz that they produced and their, their chord changes and stuff like that. I like that so much. I got a chance once to join Louis, and um, the bass player in his in his band was a friend of mine, and he told me that Louis was looking for a clarinet player. He said, you should go and show him how you, your clarinet playing. So we were over in North Minneapolis one night, and I went over there, and um, uh, I hadn't played clarinet in, since I was out of the Navy. So I went over there and um, I practiced for a couple of days and more than, that, more than that, about a week. And so I went to this joint and played and, and Louis liked it. So we had made a, you know, I thought, well, sure, I'll go. So I'm gonna join the band. He says, but I'm leaving. He said, I've been at Louis for two years and I, I miss my family and everything, so I'm going back to California. Take off, I said, well, you're gonna leave me, you know, with, I thought you were gonna stay, you know. And I said, well, if you're gonna leave, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay here in the Twin Cities. I have no point in me doing that. So that's what I did, I stayed. And I love this plan very much. The old stuff especially, uh, the Hot Five, um, Hot Six, I mean, what is it, hot? I think it was Hot Five and something like that. They're great recordings and um, he was at, in his prime and everything and uh, Louis Armstrong was just great. It was wonderful. My name is Ben Petrie and I'm a curator here at the History Center and you're in the MGG exhibit. It's uh, Minnesota's Greatest Generation and, and Irv Williams is one of our main participants here and you can see his uh, saxophone which was probably one of the hardest things to do was to ask her for this saxophone uh, to put on exhibit because uh, as you likely know he played this for about 30 years so he knows every little nuance every little piece of this little microphone he was very generous and very kind to even consider to give us this baby of his microphone. And like I said, it was one of the hardest things to ask for. And he's still playing it. But he did. He was gracious enough to give it to us. And we actually accompanied him down to the music, a music store to buy another one to replace it, which is... <laughs> and he's played with every luminary you could think that came through here and, and other places. And well respected by anybody that's ever heard him and known him. Um, but again, it's more than that uh, for me, and I suspect for anybody else that's heard him play. And I remember just sitting in an artist quarter and uh, a couple, a few chairs away from 
on, to the left of where he was playing on stage. And you're in another world. You're transported. When you hear those first notes, the, the smoothness, his, his tone, his tonality, and that's what's, that's what's important to me. And with this greatest generation, his music affected so many lives, affected so many children, the kids that come in here who he's, he's gone to all kinds of schools and, and spoken uh, and helped kids to learn about jazz and to learn about their instruments. And, um, but they would, oh, I know that man. Oh, he came to our school. Or the musicians that come through here that knew her. It's a powerful statement, you know, to have that impact. And it's all about not so much his reputation, but about how he made them feel when they heard him play. And so that's a big part of it for me, and I'm sure for a lot of people. So to have this saxophone and to know what came out of it, uh, how people felt to hear those notes, and how it changed, how it, you know, they may have been in a bad mood. They may have been that bit ambivalent. Uh, but you're sitting there and you're hearing something that gives you a good feeling. And that's what music is all about. So I'm glad. Every time I see this, that's what I think about. <laughs> yeah, well, my grandmother started me on, on uh, um, playing, she uh, uh, bought a violin for me, and so I started playing violin. And then um, I had a had a lung problem, and so I, then I started. Um, uh, he, he bought a clarinet for me, so I started playing the clarinet, and it went from that from playing the saxophone and stuff like that. It's a tough profession, and I got to go to work. <laughs> gig at the Dakota from 4.30 to 6.30, and I'm fixing to go play. <laughs> Grandmother went to Indian school. Uh, my, my mother went to um, uh, University of Cincinnati Music School, and um, she, um, uh, she got a degree, and um, uh, she got a job at Philander Smith College in, in Little Rock, Arkansas, which is a, a, a Methodist uh, a school of, uh, funded by the Methodist Church of America. And she had met, met my dad there. My dad was a chemistry instructor. And um, um, she was involved in um, the same kind of um, um, deal that Fisk University had, which was uh, 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 a bunch of singers that toured the country, raising funds for the for the schools that they were. and the Fisk Jubilee Singers, of course, were very famous. Uh, they had a guy that uh, uh, went on to be one of the greatest uh, tenors of all time. His name was Ro Roland Hayes. So uh, he was a, a member of the Fisk University Singers. So these were the Philander Smith Singers, and she uh, took them around um, uh, to different places and sang and everything. I know too much. I don't know too much about it because at the time I was about uh, 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 three, two or three years old. So I just don't know much about it. But that's how they met and they married. And my dad was <clears throat> found, found decided to go to medical school, medical school. And my grandfather was on the board of trustees of the Mahara Medical College. And he arranged for my dad to, uh, to go to school at, at Mahara Medical College. That's where he went. Uh, my grandmother and grandfather um, uh, were uh, two two uh, great people that um, raised a, a very large family, uh, six girls and one boy, and all the girls, all of, I don't know all about all, but quite a few of them. She went to um, the reservation to have have uh, their births, and at the time, uh, uh, my grandfather was at um, 
Atlanta University in, in, in Atlanta, Georgia. And he was, um, he, had, he started a newspaper, and the news, newspaper was uh, very popular. And uh, he went from Atlanta to be closer to um, uh, the headquarters of the um, uh, Methodist Church. Uh, the headquarters of the um, uh, Methodist Church. And so he moved to Cincinnati and uh, got a, a nice house there on 23 Park Avenue in, in, uh, in Cincinnati. And it was a block, about a block from Douglas School, which I went to Douglas School. Douglas School, school had been high school, but uh, they built another high school for, for, for people uh, and the high schools were integrated in, in Ohio. And so I went to that school and my grandmother and grandfather, uh, he was on the road all the time um, doing uh, church, church, church stuff and he was raising money. He was uh, personal friends with uh, Andrew Carnegie and um, quite a few of the guys. Uh, the guy that was uh, was president of Sears and Roebuck, his name was, I think it was Rosenwald, if I'm not mistaken, because that was a Rosenwald fund that was also, you know, blacks um, uh, do stuff, you know. Carnegie Foundation uh, in Little Rock uh, uh, gave the, uh, uh, the people that were uh, trying to get this hospital uh, uh, equipped, the United Friends Hospital in Iraq was trying to get them equipped, and so they they gave money for the so they could have red X-ray machines and and uh, uh, operating uh, rooms and operating equipment and stuff like that. So I thought that was great. In 1929, we're about 10 or so. Do you remember when the Great Depression hit, and was it really as hard as the history book portrayed? Uh, yes, it was tough. Um, <clears throat> I was um, I was in um, I was in Cincinnati. My sister and I were in Cincinnati, and my grandmother died. And so uh, they decided they were going to uh, take me, uh, send me back to Little Rock with my dad. And I must have been about nine, something like that, eight or nine. No, I was younger than that uh, because I was all set to go to kindergarten. Um, and that was the year my mother passed away. So I. I had gone halfway of the year to, to kindergarten and she passed away. And then I was sent back to Cincinnati and I stayed in Cincinnati until my grandmother died, which was, uh, I think I was 12 years old. Then I came back to Little Rock. A lot of people's image of the civil rights movement include motos, water hoses, cocktails, dogs, beatings, and the upheaval of violence. These things were characterized by the media covered the civil rights movement. What was your own perspective? Were you involved in it or did it have any kind of impact on you in any way? Uh, well, naturally it had all kinds of impact upon me, but I wasn't involved in that too much. I was involved uh, uh, one incident in um, Pine Bluff, Arkansas where I was going to college. And other, other than that, um, I had, uh, in 1927, and during that period of time, while I was with my dad, there were lynchings and stuff like that in Arkansas. And not only in Arkansas, all across the South. Uh, but um, I more or less was screened from all that. And um, 
when the depression started, um, I was in, in Little Rock because my my uh, grandmother had just passed away, and it's 1931, I think it was. Yeah, it was true, because I was 11 years old. And um, we, we were pretty well cushioned against uh, with anything, because my grandfather was um, uh, well entrenched into the Methodist Church, and he was one of those people that they could not do without because uh, they had, the Methodist Church had a, um, uh, what they call a Southern Conference, which included an almost, um, in, it, in its entirety, it included all black churches. They were called a Southern Conference. And my, my grandfather always fought that. And, um, it was um, it was a, it was a hard thing for him to take everything, and but uh, uh, a few years after his death, they uh, abolished the, the Southern Conference. So all of he all he did to try to uh, to change it uh, must have helped quite a bit. You said you said there were lynchings. You, did you see any lynchings or any of the bodies? I, 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 didn't, yeah, I didn't see any lynchings, but I, I was down, down on 9th Street, which was a, a, a black district, and a lynch mark passed by my dad's drugstore. Went down a couple of blocks down, and a lynch this guy set him on fire and stuff like that, but I never saw any of that. But I heard about it, you know. Your last C D, finality. Does this represent any type of reflections in your life? Does the title represent a change in your outlook and your new perspective on the end of your life? And how do you put this music and feeling? How do you put this feeling into your music? I don't know. That's hard to do. I just, uh, I just play the way I feel. And there is no, that's no, there is no um, uh, set formula to do it. It's just, uh, it just happens, you know. It's just, uh, uh, you can't acquire it because you have to have it. You have to, if you're going to be a jazz musician, uh, you can't go into a, um, a school and acquire the feel. You can acquire uh, musicianship. You can uh, you can acquire um, uh, the knowledge of the music, and everything. But that and having a feel for it are two different things. And and, and I always have contended that that's something that you have to be born with. And of course, uh, guys can play and and. Uh, uh, learn chords and stuff like that can play the jazz tradition, but the feel is not there, you know. And that's the problem with uh, with the music today. Is the fact they have quite a few kids going to school, and when they come out, they're great, they're wonderful. But there's something lacking in in their their education, which uh, you cannot educate the feel for the music. It's just like a blues player that sits down and, uh, and talks about his experience and uh, he sings the blues and he, he sings the words, what, uh, the way he feels about it and stuff like that. And there are people that have tried to get that tradition and and go with it, but it's impossible to do that, you know, because you have to live the life. So music is is uh, great. There there are people out there playing everything, but some of them lack lack the the, the feel for the music, and uh, sometimes it can be very superficial. Oh, I'm here. Mm -hmm. When you were a kid, mm -hmm. why did you select that picture? Ego. 
<laughs> That's the only reason why. I said, well, what am I going to do? I got pictures on most of my albums, my sick and tired of it. I don't want to see a picture. And then I ran across this kid picture, and I said, well, that's it. And this album, that album was, um, was really, the, really the finality of as far as uh, what I'm doing or what I'm playing, anything like that. Everything that uh, uh, I'm doing now is superseded by um, what I did for that, that one year when I was 90 years old because I had um, one of the great um, um, gospel singing groups and to, to sing for me and, um, uh, and I can't think of any. <laughs> and um, um, that was uh, that was the same as me having um, as they're, as they're having a um, um, what do you call it? After you die, you know, they have a little thing and so forth. That's what they were having for me. <laughs> I just want to be make sure that I saw it. Do you remember the first time you casted your first ballad? Did it mean anything to you in hindsight? And now, when we look at how black folks in the past had the struggle to fight for a vote, now we have an African-American president in the White House. Can you give some comments on that? I sure can. Um, <clears throat> I, I was, um, I, I really didn't want Obama to win because I knew that uh, he would be saddled with all the stuff that had happened in the Bush administration and and the, the wars and and 711 and the fact the fact that um, uh, there had been a lot of graft going on with the banks and stuff like that and I I voted for him but uh, I felt that Republicans should win and be saddled with that stuff. It's, it was kind of selfish on my part, uh, and everything is uh, like I said it would be because uh, he's being—he's done a great job, I think. Uh, he couldn't—he couldn't let uh, General Motors go bankrupt or any of the other stuff that happened in the automobile, because I think we have automobile um, uh, economy. You know, how the automobile goes is how the economy goes. And um, so I believe, uh, I, I think he's done a great job and I sure will vote for him to get back, to stay in, now that he's, now he's sat all this, this other stuff that he has uh, taken on, you know. And uh, they are saying that uh, uh, the government still has, had a, has a lot of stock uh, from General Motors, and uh, the government can't get their money back. Uh, I I never heard that. I heard that General Motors had repaid everybody, so I don't know what they're talking about. I'll have to check that out. <laughs> I just read it a couple of days ago. You just turned 93, mm -hmm. how does it feel? Mm -hmm. Do you feel younger, wiser? I, I don't feel any of that stuff. I, I feel that I have survived. And I have survived um, with my own set of, of uh, values. And I have I've maintained those values at, at, at great uh, personal um, uh, s sadness that I have, but I uh, I've done the things that I wanted to do, and my kids are all law abiding, and uh, um, I just feel that um, um, I've I've been lucky to do a good job. And, you know, it's been tough working two jobs and. Stuff, you know, and I'm, I'm not complaining about it, I'm just saying 
that's what happened, you know. Dry cleaning during the day and music uh, the, right down the street at Hilton Hotel for 15 years. Okay. Seven nights a week and five days a week. Awesome. What are your hopes for the arts world 20 years from now? What do you think the role of artists are in this world? And, or do you think they even will have a role? You know, there is so much um, uh, electronic and uh, all, all that kind of stuff going on. You just cannot say what's going to happen, you know, because by no one thing, uh, there'll be a lot fewer musicians because of everything can be reproduced electronically and everything. And uh, uh, I don't know where there would be room for the, the serious guys, you know, the serious people that want to play. And, and jazz, I don't know what's going to happen to jazz because um, the younger kids that are coming up are, are into the pop field and and other stuff like hip hop and and uh, advanced rock and roll, I guess you call it, and all that stuff. And um, it's 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 quite it's quite an industry. I mean, it's really big, and uh, uh, it, the electronic or media has uh, as as is one that's uh, the cause of it being as big as it is, you know. And we never had this in, in my day uh, when pop music was uh, uh, a little childish song or something like that that people liked and everything. Happy birthday, Irv. Happy birthday, Irv. I love you so much. Happy 93rd birthday. I want to tell you that uh, I've worked at the Dakota for nine years, and I come here every Friday just to hear you at happy hour. You're such a lovely man. I love your son, your entire family, and all the contributions that you've uh, given to Minnesota and uh, the Dakota. We just thank you so much. Have a wonderful birthday. I am Amanda Williams. I'm Irv Williams' uh, youngest daughter of nine children. Today is his 93rd birthday. We're at the Dakota in Minneapolis celebrating. Happy birthday, Dad. We love you. It's been a long 93 years. We hope that uh, you continue on uh, into your hundreds. Uh, we got money on it, so <laughs> you know what to do. Happy birthday, Grandpa! Happy birthday, Grandpa! Ha, 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 ha.